Welcome back to Play Tessie. It is episode 35. If you're listening on drop day, it's February 5th. And 35, there's some weird relievers for this one. So we're just going to name off a few. We've got Burke Badenhop, Matt Andrees, Richard Blyer. And I'm going to give you a couple others, Sammy, that I didn't mention. Eric Hosmer and Matt Stairs. Matt Wait. Stairs? No. <laughs> Matt Stairs played for the Red Sox. Well, he was 35? According to Baseball Almanac. Why did I think he was 11? Matt Stairs. You know what? I'm glad you brought up Matt Stairs. Hey, you're right. 35. Look at that. 1995. Did he play twice for the Red Sox? Or am I crazy? No, just once. Wow. Um, I'm glad you brought up Matt Stairs. We'll 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 bring the conversation back to our boy Matt Stairs. Uh, uh, for my enough said. Oh wow. Okay, yeah. so it's gonna come full circle. Yeah, but it's gonna be a full circle stairs episode. This is the official podcast of bowling teams with clever names like Pin Pals and Split Pants. Now you know what I did today. Um, is also <laughs> the official Red Sox podcast of WEEI. The Red Sox Radio Network. Before we get going, just remember to hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button wherever you're listening. Odyssey app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Hit us up on YouTube. We're, we're getting episodes put up on that WEEI channel. Uh, we've got a bunch of them up there. You can check out our interviews with Pap, Jared Carabas, Chris Murphy. Those are up there right now. And make sure to hit those, uh, hit that thumbs up on those videos. That helps us out a lot. A lot. And remember to hit those subscribe button. All your platforms, wherever you're listening, helps us out. You get that notification too. But Sammy, we haven't spoken in podcast form at least mm. since the the big Red Sox news of the off season. Theo That's Epstein right. mm-hmm. has returned to the organization. We'll say he is he is aboard the FSG ownership group, and he will serve as an advisor to the Red Sox. Yeah, man. I mean, I know there was some smoke. Shout out to Jared, who had this in November, I think. But uh, I was surprised. I did not expect that. Rob Bradford, our buddy, he dropped that uh, that tweet at like 9 in the morning saying, what do you say, Red Sox have something cooking? Something like that. He dropped the uh, eye emojis. He's, yeah. He told me later, he's like, I hate doing the eye emojis, but I did the eye emojis. <laughs> no, no, the eye emojis is great. Though when you're, if you use Twitter and you see eye emojis in like a trade season, you just get excited. So, um, yeah, so I saw that immediately. I'm thinking, oh, my God, maybe these these dorks in the ownership group have caved and they finally have signed uh, enough players to field a full major league team. Crazy concept. I was wrong. But still, we got good news. Theo, uh, I think probably the most universally liked Red Sox figure, aside from like maybe Big Poppy, uh, that anyone could think of. Can't say a negative thing about the guy. He was... Like he was the architect of the 2004 Red Sox ends there, uh, but you could keep going. So it's exciting, man. I, I, I don't know really how to feel about it. A hundred percent. I'm kind of, my opinion is kind of morphing as more information comes out about what his role is going to be exactly. So yeah, it, it's exciting though. And I'm glad we have something to talk about other than like, what if this happens? What if the Red Sox sign this player that they're not going to sign? So I don't know. Positivity. It's okay to be happy for a little bit, Red Sox fans. We did it. We can smile. They did. They did something good. They did something good. And I, to your point about about your opinion evolving and not really quite knowing how to feel. Like I'm sure we're gonna learn more next week. They dropped this news on a Friday morning, so like we obviously had that really really well put together article from Chris Cotillo and Sean McAdam, but outside of that, we haven't heard a a ton. I know Jen McCaffrey, I think had an article as well, but we'll, we'll obviously learn more as the, as the weeks and months go on. But it was just interesting because my, my opinion at the start of this, they dropped the news of Theo, you read the Sportico article that they, that they leaked the news in and the quotes are all about Theo joining FSG and having an impact on all these different entities and they make it, it felt like they made it a point to make it seem like he wasn't jumping right into the Red Sox. Like this is an FSG thing, not necessarily a Red Sox thing. But as you learned a little bit more as the day went on, it started to feel a little bit more like he's here for the Red Sox. He's here because 
Fenway Sports Group doesn't think that they've given enough attention from an ownership perspective to the Red Sox in recent years. Uh, they want to win the fans back. Stuff like that. You hear that and you hear that he's going to be heavily involved with the Red Sox. Like my opinion, like on that Friday, it's like specifically on that Friday was all over the place. But I ended the day thinking, yes, this is good. This is this is not nothing. This is legitimately good. It's not when I recorded with Rob, my opinion was it can't hurt. And yeah. it maybe it maybe it will end up there again. But at this point in time, I it's hard to say it's anything but good. Yeah, I'm kind of still in that camp, to be totally honest. I'm in the in the thought group of thinking like it can't be a negative at the very least. And this is how we are as Red Sox fans at this point. We're so afraid to say something is good. And that is so understandable. I don't blame anyone who's kind of feeling that way. But the the reason I'm happy about this is because it cannot be bad. I can't envision a situation where this is bad. To me, it sounds like he's kind of serving as uh, a tutor. And that's not a perfect comparison. But it sounds like he's going to be, you know, he's going to be posing questions. He's going to be a sounding board, as Catillo wrote in the article. Catillo, excuse me. And um, that's, that can't Catillo, hurt. Catillo. 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 Catillo, Catillo. Chris. Um, Chris. But yeah, it, it can't be a bad thing. I think that if you're Craig Breslow, this is where it gets a little confusing to me. I have to wonder how Craig Breslow feels. He's been on the job for how many how many months? When did he first become the, the you know, GM? Was it November? Was it? November? Okay. So it's been a few months. And now they're bringing in Theo. And I don't want to turn this into a negative. Again, I'm going to try to be positive because this is a good thing. Got to wonder how Craig Breslow feels. Now, of course, they have a past relationship from the Cubs, but it still kind of feels like, you know, maybe Craig is studying for the big exam to be the GM, and then is his parents, Red Sox ownership, go, we think you need a tutor to help you out. And he's like, but I know how to do this. I, I don't need a tutor. But, you know, it's not a perfect comparison. So that's the only part that kind of confuses me. I got, I am super curious to know how Craig Breslow feels about this. And I had a kind of tongue in cheek tweet the other day saying poor Craig Breslow. Now from here on out, if he does anything positive, the reaction is going to be like, look what Theo did. This happened because Theo got here. And there's no way to verify if that's true or not. It's probably not true. If like the next move Craig Breslow makes, my first thought is not going to be look what Theo did. That was Theo. I'm still going to give Breslow credit. However, knowing that Theo is now in the background, it gives me as a fan a sense of sense of comfort, like a security sense. Like we have somebody who knows what they're doing in the mix now. And that's a good thing. Yeah. And not, not just knows what they're doing, but has a history of being able to kick John Henry in the ass and tell him, you need to do this. You need to get this player. You need to make this financial expenditure. You need to take this risk. That's something that I think we saw Heim Bloom have a whole almost four-year tenure with the Red Sox, and he never had a senior advisor. He was a first-time lead executive, and he didn't have yeah. someone on the staff who had done it before to, to help him learn the ropes. And he didn't – I mean, obviously he had – his staff that was with the Red Sox under previous GMs and stuff, but they, he didn't have a lead exec. And those conversations between the lead exec and John Henry, when it comes to big expenditures, those are important conversations that no one in the organization when Heim Bloom was there had ever had. And obviously we can't verify it ourselves, but based off of the evidence of what players got signed, it didn't feel at least from an outside perspective, like, those conversations were either being had or if they were being had, if Heim Bloom was doing a good enough job being persuasive enough to convince John Henry to get that, to get whatever guy he was interested in at the time. Now, if Craig Breslow has a guy that he likes, Theo Epstein at the worst case scenario, like obviously worst case scenario, he's a sounding board. Best case scenario, he can be a little bit of a middleman, have help Craig Breslow have those conversations that he's never had before. It can be intimidating. You're going up to someone who has made their legacy off of making ridiculous amounts of money, and you're telling him to spend a lot of it, hundreds of millions of dollars in a lot of these cases. It's not an easy conversation to have. Having a guy like Theo there, whether whether he's helping him with the conversation or helping him prepare for the conversation that Breslow eventually has, 
it's a valuable voice to have there. It just, you can't, you can't get around it. Yeah. And it's also, a, it's a confidence booster. If you look at it in the right way, I guess you could call it the right way. But like, if we did a who says no, and then we presented the who says no to Breslow or Theo or uh, any of Rob's GM friends, then like, and they said, yeah, th this makes sense. This is a good trade. Wouldn't you feel so much more confident about your own ability to understand the way this operates and the way that trades work and the way that values scale? Like if you're Craig Breslow and you have an idea and you're like, okay, I'm thinking of pulling the trigger on this or I'm thinking of making this offer. Before I do, let me quick call to Theo, explain it to him, get his two cents on it. And then he says, yes, you probably feel much better and you're less... You know, you sleep better at night. You feel better about making more bold trades that he, the aforementioned uncomfortable trades that he's alluded to, kind of sort of made a few of them, but not really the big one, the big splash. I don't think we're getting that, but you know what I mean? It's just a good, it's a good safety net for him as well. It's not just for the fans. It's a safety net for Craig Breslow. So if he's unsure, he now has someone to go to, someone other than like John Henry, who probably doesn't even know <laughs> who Von Grissom is, so... Uh, I'm happy about it. I don't, don't think, you know, I saw some people being negative, like, oh, this Craig Breslow's not able to handle this. They already have to bring in someone to help him. I don't think it's like that at all. I think the best, best part of this, and I don't want to quote it because I'm going to mess it up. I don't have it right in front of me. But in Chris Cotillo slash Cotillo's article, he discussed how privately the Red Sox said, we have kind of not been paying enough attention to the Red Sox. And I feel like that's been, that should be the lead. I feel like the lead has kind of been buried. That's fucking huge. We've been saying that for, I mean, myself, I've only been saying it for this year. I was naive enough to think like they have a plan, you know, they're going to, you know, the plan that they kind of sold us on. But now they're saying it. And I think it's extra special because nobody attached their name to that. Nobody wants to be attributed to that, that quote. That was a private thing that was said and reported. And it hasn't been refuted at all which makes me think it's true. So that admission makes me feel a hell of a lot better. On one hand, it's sad that this is what makes us excited now. But on the other, it feels like we're slowly, 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 slowly trending in the right direction. And for that, I'm happy. I think you hit the nail on the head there. That, that, that quote in that article, that little tidbit is what got me from it can't hurt to this is good. Because to me, it's less about what Theo is going to do specifically. Because we all know an executive can only really, like executives can be talented and they can be good and they can make rosters really good with, with limited payrolls. But a lot of these executives are only as good as the money put forth by ownership. Mm -hmm. And that little piece, Theo Epstein being back here in part because FSG recognizes that they haven't given the Red Sox enough attention is so, so huge. Yeah. That, that, that makes all the difference in the world. And, and to add on to that, you have to remember, like, Theo Epstein may be joining specifically FSG and not specifically the Red Sox, but you, you and I both know that he knows what he's getting himself into here. He's now jumping back yeah. into the Red Sox where his legacy is written. He has nothing left to prove. Spe definitely not in this market. He And he knows name, how to handle like a bad vibe Boston too. He was around when we were the lovable lose. We, sorry, I, that's like, oh God, I hate when people say that. No. When the Red Sox were the, you know, the lovable losers of the league, the curse. Uh, 83 years, 84 years, 85 years, 86 years. And he's been there. So he knows like, he knows how to weather the storm. He's been through worse than this. Like, I know people are going to say of our age group, you know, mid to late 20s, I'm still in my 20s. Um, people are going to say, like, this is the worst that it's ever felt to be a Red Sox fan. And you're probably right if you feel that way. But when I was a little kid, oh, my God, my you know, my parents, my uncles, like my friend's parents, you know, telling you every time if you say you're into the Red Sox. Well, they're never going to win. They'll never win. The Yankees always yeah. beat us. You were, we've you seen were a it. Kid. We know they can win. Say you, were, you were a kid watching like you were a kid watching Jim Rice, man. I like I get it. You had that yeah. 86 season. It was magical. Like I was at Jim Rice's Red Sox debut. <laughs> I was uh, drinking beer legally. Yeah. At his uh, debut. Yeah. God. No, but the, uh, the, the, the thing 29, here, Sammy, 29, everyone. 
29. I'm not that old. Multiply it by two. Oh, well, <laughs> what is it, 58? <laughs> Good math. There you go, kid. There you yeah, go. my brain is still sharp. See? <laughs> Hell yeah. No, but what what I'm what I'm saying though, Sammy, is Theo Epstein is a guy that is uber competitive, and his legacy in Boston is written. Like he doesn't have anything left to prove here. So why would he come here, even if it's in an ownership standpoint? Like he understands how this is going to be seen publicly. He's not going to sign on here just to watch the Red Sox lose and have people try to tear down the legacy that he built like this. He's not going to come here if he thinks that's what's happening and he's not going to let it happen. Yeah. So, he cares. He gives a shit about the baseball team. You know, <laughs> like that's so sad that we're like, this guy actually cares about the baseball team. Like we, we okay. Let me, let me backtrack a teeny, teeny bit before that quote uh, where an anonymous source in the front office said, that they have not been paying enough attention to the Red Sox. Um, and we can get the exact quote in a moment. But what did you think? Did you believe that the Red Sox were self or Sorry, excuse me. Fenway Sports Group was self-aware that they were neglecting the Red Sox? Uh, well, I didn't until now. I mean, I think that the fan reaction has a lot to do with it. This is two straight years of getting booed at winter weekend. I, I think... We don't have access to this data, but I'm sure their their season ticket sales and data related to all that is not as strong as it's been in the past. It's probably far weaker than it's been in any year since they've owned the team. Gordo, I had, and I looked this guy up. I won't say the guy's name because he's just doing his job. Probably like a 23, 24-year-old kid reach out to me with a Red Sox email asking if I would jump on a Zoom call or a phone call and talk about getting Red Sox season tickets. Has that ever happened? Have you ever gotten an email? Like we've gotten the promo emails. This was signed by this guy, this young adult. <laughs> this makes me sound old again. Um, and he was, he was literally asking like, do you have time to chat? Let's talk about Red Sox season tickets. I, I thought it was like a, not like a scam at first, but I found the kid on LinkedIn. It wasn't a scam. It works for the Red Sox. They were asking me to get on a, phone call to discuss this and you know i'm not it, this this kid is not the reason they're not spending money so i said hey like fenway's my favorite place in the world i love it um however for the and i said for the first time in my life i'm you know i'm not one of those boycott fenway people but i'm going to be cutting back a little bit like i don't like the product they're putting out it it depresses me when i go to fenway and half the crowd is rooting for the other team like we never that never happened when we were kids we never saw that the worst was like maybe the crowd was like 10, 15 percent Yankees fans. But that's our, you know, the most famous team in the league, the Red Sox, number one rival. And it's a quick drive away. So that makes sense. But when you go to Fenway and they're playing, I won't even use the Dodgers, the San Francisco Giants. And half the crowd is rooting for San Fran. That's depressing to me. They're encroaching on our home territory. And I told the kid, like, it's just like it, it's not a good product right now. It depresses me and. Um, and I'm sorry to you. Like, I, I totally understand you're doing your job, but um, hopefully next year. Or I said, maybe next year I'll be more interested. Have a good one. And so that is, uh, I'm glad you sparked my memory right there. I kind of forgot that that happened, but has have you ever gotten an email like that? Dude, I, I got one of those during the lockout, if you can believe it. I had I had a personal email sent to me during the lockout trying to, buy, to sell me tickets. What? When there's no games? Yeah. Or it was either during the lockout or when it was coming. I don't know. It was it was right in lockout territory. And so I like 2021 or 2022. I'm blanking. Heading into 2022. OK, right, right, right. Got it. Got it. And like the Sox were coming off a playoff run. Like things felt good. I mean, I know they let Schwar Actually, they hadn't at that point let Schwarber go. I want to say Erod was gone by then. But Schwarber was mm -hmm. not. But like. They hadn't gotten story yet, but they were coming off an ALCS, so like they can do almost no wrong. But it's just, yeah, the I did I don't I didn't even respond to the email just because I mean, what what am I buying? But yeah, let me ask you a question, Sammy. Because I, it's crazy. They always say it's darkest before the dawn, and and it and it really is. That theory holds water because the day before they bring Theo in, and like obviously we feel really good hearing this Theo news. But the day before that, the Orioles traded for Corbin Burns 
And when you look at, at Linda Pizzuti's Instagram, they're holding what they are calling a town hall for the PGA thing. And it's, I just thought that that was so insulting that they had John Henry stand up there with a microphone and call it a town hall, but it's for golf. I thought that was very, <laughs> I thought that was insulting. And I'm curious if you agree with me here, because I, I think the timing of this Theo Epstein announcement, obviously these are things that are in the works for long periods of time before they actually get done. Do you think the timing is a little bit suspicious or am I just being all like, what's it called? Like conspiratorial conspiracy. I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist um, here, but I think it holds water. Do I think the timing is odd? Like in, like in what way? Like, I, I don't, I don't, are you, are you implying it's like a response to Corbin Burns? Cause I don't think that. No, I'm, I'm saying that they knew that they were going to have to, in my opinion, this is just a guess for me. I think that they knew, Hey, we're going to have to announce this PGA thing and, and answer these questions and be public about it. And it's going to really piss oh. off Red Sox fans. So, you know, you're coming aboard. Um, but we're going to save this one, have it in our back pocket to pull out when we need some good PR and we're going to need it then. I actually hadn't thought about that. That's kind of interesting. I, my initial thought would be no, just because I still think it's kind of weird timing. Like you could have done this months ago and it would have quelled the storm. And then the PJ announcement wouldn't have like, it's people are going to get upset about that regardless. But yeah, no, I, I would say no, but I, I don't think that's too crazy. I've heard some weird conspiracies about it. That one is kind of, that one makes sense, but I, I would still lean no. I, I feel like, I, I really, to be totally honest, I don't under, understand the timing. It's really weird. Like I said, Jared had it in November. Why it was announced in, what was that, a uh, February 1st, February 2nd? Like, it's just weird. It's so Red Sox, just no rhyme or reason. We don't really understand it. We're just kind of like, all right, Theo's back in February <laughs> or a month away from pitchers and catchers or not even a month away. So uh, no, no, I, I'm going to say no. I don't think that's why. Okay. You're, you, you are nicer to them than I am because I just, I just like look at them doing this town hall thing and I just, it boils my blood and I just, I, I believe the worst in them. So. No, I think you're I think you're nicer to them. You're the one who's implying that they that they thought this out. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think, I think they're just like, did we get it done yet? Okay, yeah, you announce it. I think they're conniving. You think they're stupid. Yeah, neither of us is nice. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather be conniving or stupid? Uh I think I would rather they be conniving. Mm. Because if they're conniving, then sometimes that leads, I don't know, sometimes like competitors are conniving. They're trying to get little advantages. Yeah. So we just pass. need them to be conniving in the right way. Like Belichick. Yeah, Belichick's conniving. Yeah. Yeah. Like learn every little letter of the rule book and like use it. I, yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm going, I'm going stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next question I got for you, Sammy. Does any part of you in wake of this and in wake and like in, in response to reading the article where they, they talk about why Theo was brought back? Does any part of you have a slightly more opti optimistic outlook, not about free agency this year and not about the team this year, but about next year? Because I'm not saying I'm there, and I'll, I'll give my take after you give yours, but my dream from start to finish of this whole thing has been how can we get Juan Soto on the Red Sox for 15 years? Hmm. And maybe it's not maybe it's not Juan Soto. Maybe it's one of the gazillion starting pitchers that's available, but does them – caring enough and realizing that they were that they have been wrong and bringing back the OEP scene make you believe that maybe expenditures like that could happen a year from now uh very slightly I still don't think that the Red Sox are gonna be like a team that gets the number one guy I feel like they've always rather go after like two tier two guys you know what I mean if that makes any sense like they'd rather get like story like David Price and JD Martinez. Neither was the number one in the position on the market, but they were like the second best. Like I the think second Price was. Best. Was Price think... the number one? All right, bad example. You Price know, was. JD Martinez. There you go. Uh John Carlos Stanton was coming off the MVP season. It was John Carlo and JD. 
And, you know, the Yankees got John Carlo, which famously worked out. And everyone was like, oh, the Red Sox could have had him. Imagine him at Fenway because he bats right-handed, you know, evergreen thing to say. And then they get J.D. Martinez at the uh, 11th hour. You know, second best guy, still an unbelievable bat. I feel like that's kind of the Red Sox way of operating. So I feel more confident about the future. I don't think they're going to go after like a Juan, a Juan Soto type. That's going to be, I mean, what is that contract going to be? Like 12 years-ish, 32 million a year. Something. Half a billion somewhere. He, he might hit half a billion. No, Sammy, yeah. I, I, I prefaced the question acting like I was hopeful about it, but I'm not. I That's not to say that I'm not hopeful about the future of the team and, and more hopeful about the future of, of their payrolls than I was last week at this time. No, I don't think Theo Epstein is going to march into John Henry's office and convince him to spend half a billion dollars on Juan Soto. But as I said, there's like this, there's a ton of great starting pitchers set to hit the market next year, just to name a few, Corbin Burns, Walker Bueller, Max Freed. Oh, who's another Sammy? Help me out. Zach Wheeler is scheduled to hit the market. Yeah. He might get extended. There's others too. Nick that I'm, <laughs> Nick Pavetta. Yeah. yeah. Nice. But like there's guys that are going to hit the market next year and their payroll is down and they've got more money coming off the books. Like, yeah, we know, I know they traded Chris sale, but there's another 17 million that they are paying him and that money's going to come off the books next year. So do I think that they're going, that Theo Epstein coming back is going to signal this complete reversal back to when FSG and John Henry were ready to sign sign off on almost anything and they're going to they're going to sign Carl Crawford and trade for Adrian Gonzalez and extend him in the same offseason. No, I don't think that's going to happen, but do I think that there's hope for higher payrolls? Yes, because I like I said I don't think Theo Epstein is going to come back here if he doesn't think the Red Sox are going to win and put their best foot forward to win. He has way too much to lose to do that. See, I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't want to be cynical, but the reason he took this job is because he wants to eventually get into ownership. So, like, if he's getting into ownership, does he really care, like, what the Red Sox look like? He's not He's not taking the uh, the blame nor the credit if they do well. He so, will, like, though. He will. He it won't. But not among his peers. I don't think he no, will among his peers. That's correct. But But amongst the masses, there's no way to come back into this organization and not be tied to every single thing the Red Sox do, whether it's deserved or not. And to your point... Probably a lot of it won't be deserved. But but I mean, if you're Theo and you want to get into ownership, you really don't care what the masses think. The masses aren't the ones you're doing the job interview with. They're not the ones who are going to be paying you or accepting you into their ownership group. I hear what you're saying. I'm just thinking like, I hope you're right. But the cynical part of my dog brain says like, mm, if Theo's end game is ownership, how much does he actually care about the Red Sox? Now, that's not to say he doesn't care. I think he does. If I, if you know, gun to my head, I would say, yeah, of course he cares about the Red Sox, it's Theo Epstein. But what's his ultimate goal to get into ownership? So I'm just treading a little more lightly than most on this. But like I said at the beginning of the show, it's a good thing. You know, if you want to leave it at that, fine. To what level is it going to make a difference? I'm not sure. Like you mentioned. Theo's good at, you know, kicking John Henry in the butt and telling him, you know, that it would be good to do X, Y, Z. At this point with this roster, what's he going to tell him? Hey, you got no pitching. You need a pitcher. And John Henry's going to be like, really? <laughs> do we really? Like, I think John Henry knows that. I don't think he knows everybody on the roster, but I think he knows that the pitching, the starting pitching is not great. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm Like I said, I'm treading lightly here. I, I It's a positive. How much? Not sure. Let's wait and see. I I agree that the main the main objective here for Theo, and he said it himself in that article, that this is his stepping stone into ownership. But he could have, I mean, there the Baltimore Orioles just sold. Uh the Washington Commanders just sold. Dallas, the Dallas Mavericks just sold a big chunk of their team. Mark Cuban just sold a big chunk of that team. Uh, and there's other there's other big league teams like the Nationals were for potentially for sale. The Angels were potentially for sale. Like there's ways to get into this without putting your legacy on the line. And 
I sure. do think it's a little it's a little noteworthy that he specifically chose to come here. And I know he has connections here, and it was probably the easiest way in. And you can touch a lot of different entities because they've got a their their feet in a bunch of different waters. So I get it. But yeah, he can learn. He can learn like different. Like it probably works differently with the Penguins and Liverpool sure. than it does with the Red Sox. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to get into ownership, as much crap as we talk about Fenway Sports Group, man, that's a that's a hell of a group to be a part of. I'm sure that's a, a powerful, powerful uh, across multiple sports. So uh, yeah, hey. Good for Theo. Whatever he does, I'm rooting for him. We can't. We can never dislike Theo. That said, probably would have said that about John Henry in like 2018, and then here we are. So you know, things change. For now, always rooting for Theo. It's really funny. And before we tr we'll transition enough said after this, but I, I just I remember back when our biggest issues with ownership were, oh, they just they just want to spend too much money and pay the wrong players, like. They don't have any patience. Hmm. They just want to throw money at whoever's on the market. You're right. Like Hanley Ramirez. What? <laughs> that. Yeah. Like those signings didn't work. It's like, oh, like there's guys on the market this year and now they can't afford it because they were too impatient spending money. And it's like, well, at least they were spending money. Yeah. <laughs> well, must be nice. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if that changes. Uh, obviously, we hope it will. Neither of us anticipates that changing soon. Like, I, I don't think that Theo Epstein coming aboard is going to have, like, the Baltimore Oriole effect where all of a sudden you just, now that Theo's here, you're going to make some big trade or make some big expenditure for Jordan Montgomery or something. Don't see, the, like, if they sign Jordan Montgomery, it's going to be because he fell into their lap, not because They're they signed Montgomery. I'm telling you, I'm stay, I'm dying on that hill. In the, uh, the Pat Brown favorite phrase, I'll die on this hill. They're going to sign Jordan Montgomery. Watch. Sammy, Stop. I'm going to. I we're gonna have to we're gonna have to come up with something. I'll have to like do something for you or give you something or do something on the show if they sign Jordan Montgomery. Because you keep doing firm that horn. Just give me a firm handshake. Now I'll give you something better. We'll we'll brainstorm. I'll figure it out. We'll just a beer. Buy me a beer at Fenway. It's all good. I'll buy you. I'll buy you Budweiser. Like literally. You gotta take out a company. loan. Yeah, take out a loan so you can buy one beer at Fenway. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Enough said. I want to let you have the first one. Do you, what do you, what do you got? You got something today, right? You said something oh. about Matt Stairs. Yeah, I got a new pet peeve with like fans and people around baseball, and it's this friggin' term, positional versatility, so friggin' overplayed. I, we've been talking about who's going to be the DH. Last year they had Justin Turner. He played DH like eighty percent of the time. You know, he played around the field because he had to, but like he was valuable because he hit. We watched David Ortiz for like. 15 years, barely ever play the field. Probably the most value. Actually, probably he was the most valuable guy on like 10 different Red Sox teams. JD Martinez sucks in the field. Like the worst defensive outfielder aside from like Hanley Ramirez that you'll ever see. There you go. Hanley Ramirez, another one. I'm so sick of hearing about like, the DH needs to be able to play left field. Who fucking cares? We have so many guys who can move around the field. Pablo Reyes plays every infield position. Rob Rapsteider can play center field if he has to. Will, Thick Willie can play every outfield spot. Yoshida plays left field. Uh, Tyler O'Neill plays both corners. Jaron Duran plays left field and center field. Everyone's like, well, you can't get this guy because you need positional versatility. I hate positional versatility. I want, in my DH, I want a guy who's like Matt Stairs, who's just this out of shape guy who just hits tanks because that's what he's paid to do. Ultimately though, I mean, you know who I want to be the DH or the Red Sox. Hip him? Huh? No, no, hip. not hip or hey. My, oh. my real number one who I act like I, the number one guy in the world, I want to be the DH for the Red Sox. Who is it? What's this? Raphael Devers. Oh, come on. No, we're not doing Every, this. Everyone, everyone. Oh, man, you got to pay him. This, so mm. give, give me this. How does this logic make any sense? He's being paid a lot of money. Therefore, he has to play third base, which makes the team worse because he's bad at defense. It makes no sense. He's being paid to hit bombs. He's not being paid to play third base. So anyway, mini rant for you. I'm so sick of hearing about positional versatility. I know there's value to it, but Jesus, man, it's a DH. They should be a good hitter first and foremost. If they can play some 25th percentile defense 
at a non-primary position, great, fantastic, let him do it. But like such an overthink by everyone. Just get a guy who can bang. That's what I want. I I just I think with the whole positional versatility thing, there there is something to it, but I I just I think your priority needs to be based off of where your roster's at. And I get that the Red Sox defense isn't good, but let's put it this way. If they'd signed, like, I don't know, Teoscar Hernandez, and he's going to play a bunch of left field two or something, like, I, your defense isn't getting any better. Yeah, but, the, yeah, exactly. The defense isn't good, and it's the way to fix it is not to get a DH who can sometimes moonlight as your left fielder. Who cares? Get a right. guy who, can, who cares where he plays in the field 25 games a year? Sammy, if your lineup has Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman and Shohei Otani, and I know he's a DH, but whatever, pretend for the sake of argument. If you have all of these guys in your lineup and your middle of the order is set in stone and it is fierce, you're you're like they, teams do not want to face the middle of your lineup. Yes, and your DH is open, fine. Get a guy yeah. who can get guys off their feet. But sure. the issue to me with the approach is, yes, the Red Sox could use – a guy who could get guys off their feet, specifically Yoshida. That is certainly something that would help the team. But that wouldn't help the team as much as a guy who can hit 35 bombs out of the three spot from the right side of the plate. We've been saying and it not all to mention, Not to mention, how many guys on the roster right now can play left field? Pablo Reyes played left field in the Dominican Republic this winter. Like, they have... Here, let's go. Ref Snyder, uh, Duran, uh, Pablo, O'Neal... Abreu, that's five guys who can spell Yoshida. Because that's the one everyone wants to talk about. Yoshida, need to get him off his feet. I agree. We have five guys who can do that right now. But the issue... Like, if if they sign Soler, I don't care that he can play left field. I care that he hits. Like, it's so overstated. So, anyway, that's my rant. Uh, I'm super excited for when Rafael Devers is the DH and he can just focus on hitting, which is what he's being paid to do, rather than praying that he can do 25th percentile defense. Oh, God. Baseball. Damn, dude. When the calendar flips to 2030, I'll give you a congratulations when, like, 34 or whatever-year-old Rafi Devers is. Actually, he might be younger than that. Rafi's I just don't get the young. logic. He's got to play the field. Why? He's terrible at it, and it makes the team worse when he's in the field. It makes no sense. Ah, Sammy. You have more options for guys that you can get to be your DH. If Rafi's your DH, you only can look at third baseman for that spot. If Rafi plays third, all of a sudden, like if Rafi's DHing, Solaire's out of the question. Yeah, that's fine. So sign Matt Chapman. Then you have the best left side oh, in the, in no. the freaking league. <laughs> get out. Get out. Do all it. right. My enough said. We're recording this before the Celtics tip, and I think it's awesome. Marcus Smart. Is, is back in Boston tonight on the night of recording. Uh, he's with the Memphis Grizzlies now. He was with the Celtics for years. And the Celtics are making him their hero among us tonight, which is their, like, they honor a fan at halftime who's done something heroic. Like, these are people who are, like, saving people's lives. And Marcus Smart is getting honored because he does, well, he's being honored for his years of service in the community of Boston throughout all his years here. and. I think it's just going to be a great way for him to get that love from the TD Garden crowd. So welcome back, Marcus Smart. Like, we appreciate everything you did here, and I'm, I'm glad he's getting that honor. Yeah, love Marcus Smart. Not really much more you can say about it. Like, just the total, like, such a such a Boston player, just gritty, play defense, defense first for some reason, and this town loves defense. I like it too. So, um, yeah, big fan of Marcus Smart. What a great Boston name too. I uh, It's a bummer he's, he's not playing, right? Yeah, he's he's like injured for he has a long term injury. So, but I'm glad he made the trip. Yeah, round of applause. But anyway, that's all we got for you guys today. It's been Play Tessie episode 35. Uh, just remember, we're finishing up here. But hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button wherever you're at, wherever you're listening. Odyssey app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, catch us on YouTube. Search W E I and Play Tessie, and you'll find a bunch of our stuff up stuff up there. Uh, but yeah, hit that follow and subscribe button because we want you guys getting that notification when we drop episodes. We appreciate you all listening. Uh, but for Gordo, for Sammy, uh, this has been Play Tessie episode 35. Thanks for tuning in. Toodaloo.